I was a suburban boy. I loved animals. But I also loved hamburgers. And I loved hot dogs. And I loved pizza with sausage and pepperoni. And my mom made this meatloaf that she wrapped in bacon and she served with greasy egg noodles. And I loved all of that. I loved every piece of disgusting junk food that was served from like the window of a fast food restaurant in styrofoam with greasy napkins. And it was like this phrenological paradox. Like there was a wall built in the middle of my brain and this side of the wall loved animals with their decency and their kindness. And this side of the wall loved eating animals. And I would say it was a paradox, but it wasn't because, I mean, it is. It's a paradox. It's not a paradox, which is a paradox. And <laughs> because it was also the status quo. Like, everyone I knew loved animals. But everyone I knew loved eating animals. So it never dawned on me that this was a paradox. And on school trips, we would go to farms and visit cows and pigs and chickens. And I loved them as unconditionally as the animals in our home, the, the cows in particular, because they were shy but curious, cautious but affectionate. And I loved them, but I loved hamburgers. <laughs> so, and I loved Tucker. He was my best friend. He was like the little brother I'd never had. He used to meet me at the end of my driveway when I came home from school and we played together and we slept next to each other and I loved him so much. But I kept eating hamburgers and I kept eating hot dogs and I kept eating junk food. And then one day when I was 19 years old, I was sitting on the steps of my mom's house with Tucker and we had this orange shag carpeting. So I'm sitting on the orange shag carpeting with Tucker and the sun was coming through the windows, and it was just this perfect moment. And I looked at Tucker, who at this point was about nine years old. Fun aside, Tucker lived to be 23. So I looked at Tucker, and I saw this perfectly formed being, this individual with two eyes and a central nervous system. And all of a sudden, that phrenological wall in my head disappeared, and I extrapolated, and I realized that just as Tucker had two eyes and a central nervous system and a rich emotional life, I mean, he had personality, he was funny, he was idiosyncratic, and he had this deep desire to avoid pain and suffering and to be alive and to be happy. And so suddenly I extrapolated and I realized every creature with two eyes and a central nervous system was like Tucker. It just wanted to avoid pain and suffering and wanted to be happy. So in that moment, I left behind hamburgers, hot dogs, etc., and I became a vegan and an animal activist. And that was 35 years ago. So I've been a vegan animal activist ever since then. And it's the most important part of my life. Like, I love making music and doing other things, but animal activism surpasses the other <laughs> things that I do. And honestly, being an animal activist can be really hard because every year, 100 billion, over 100 billion animals are killed by and for humans. That's billion with a B. So it's challenging. But on another hand, being an animal activist is kind of easy because all I have to do is remind people of what they already know and remind people of what they already feel. Because I assume everyone here, except for the sociopaths, has had that experience of like bonding with a cat or bonding with a dog and feeling that heart expanding love. And of course, I mean, as I've been doing this for a long time, I've learned many things that have sort of reinforced my animal activism. Um, the fact that animal agriculture is the second leading cause of climate change, that 75% of antibiotic resistance, the plague that awaits us all, is a result of animal agriculture, because the animals on factory farms are treated so badly and they're so sick, the only thing keeping them alive are mega doses of antibiotics. The role of animal agriculture in cancer, diabetes, heart disease, Alzheimer, obesity, the fact that 90% of rainforest deforestation is attributable to animal agriculture. 50% of ocean acidification comes from animal agriculture. So all these facts sort of strengthen and buttress my activism. But at the end of the day, what sustains me as an activist is love. The unconditional love I had for all the animals I grew up with, and the unconditional love I have for all animals. And I think that's the best part of who I am, that selflessness and love 
and patience and kindness, and I think it's the best part of who we are. You know, the part of humanity that wants to protect the innocent and defend the vulnerable, that's, that's the best of humanity, not the part that puts animals in factory farms. And that epiphany, that realization, that moment I had with Tucker on the stairs in my mom's house stays with me. And that realization is sort of encoded into the core of who I am. Just the, the realization that every animal with two eyes and a central nervous system wants to avoid pain and suffering. And every animal, no matter how big or how small or how wild or how domesticated, just wants to be alive and simply wants to be happy.